we're finally ready to make our case for the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups. That's the theorem that lets us classify if I know the order of a finite abelian group. I should be able to give you a complete list of all of the groups to which that group can be isomorphic. In other words, all the possible structures, if you like, all the possible Cayley tables that we could write that describes the behavior of that group. So how does it work? Our two key pieces of evidence so far, and they're all that we need, although they're pretty important, are first of all the primes don't talk theorem. It tells us every finite abelian group can be decomposed as a direct product of its subgroups, where those subgroups have orders that are powers of primes. So in our example that we saw, every group of order 168 is a direct product of a group of order 8, a group of order 3, and a group of order 7, because that's the prime power factorization, and the prime powers don't talk to one another. But the ingredient that was missing there is, well, we know all groups of order 3 and all groups of order 7, respectively, are cyclic, because 3 and 7 are prime. But what about all groups of order 8 that are abelian? What about the prime powers? What can we say about them? And that was the next ingredient, the prime powers partition theorem. It told us that every abelian group whose order is a prime power can be completely classified into a laundry list here of possibilities just by taking the different partitions of the power of that prime. Every different partition gives me a different structure for this group up to isomorphism. So primes don't talk lets us break our group apart. Prime powers partition gives me a list of what each of the pieces in those parts can look like. And so now we're ready for the fundamental theorem. And you can always gauge a theorem and its importance by how many assumptions and hypotheses go into it. So when you see a theorem that only says, let G be a finite abelian group, then, this is a pretty powerful theorem. It tells us something that's true of every single group that is both finite and abelian, just those two ingredients. So let's illustrate it by taking a group whose order is again composite, so 1008. It's made up of, of distinct primes, maybe a lot of different powers of them. What are the different options that this theorem is going to give me for the structures that this group can have? Well, let's first hit this with the primes don't talk observation. I have an undifferentiated group of 1008 elements, but if I know that the primes don't talk to one another, then having a factorization of 1008 into 16 times 9 times 7, those are distinct powers of distinct primes, right? primes don't talk tells me that this group is definitely isomorphic to a direct product of some abelian group of order 16 with some abelian group of order 9 with some abelian group of order 7. So already we have a structure for my group. It's definitely a direct product of these three subgroups. But what do each of those subgroups get to look like? That's where the prime powers partition theorem comes in. And it tells me that I'm going to have as many possibilities as there are partitions of my exponent. So for groups of order 16 that are abelian, up to isomorphism, there are as many possibilities as there are partitions of the number 4. You have to decide how many powers of the two to leave separate and how many of them to bundle together, basically. And then same thing for the others. Well, it turns out in this case, there are five different ways to partition the number 4. Right? Partition it not at all, partition it completely, or everything in between. There's two ways to partition the number 2, either take the two together or keep the two of them separate. And of course, there's only one way to partition the number 1, after all, there's only one group of order 7 up to isomorphism. So the prime powers partition theorem gives me a complete list of all the possible ways to partition these exponents. And then as soon as I choose one example from each category, and I combine them together, that's going to give me an isomorphism class for this group of order 1008. For example, the partition 3 plus 1 of the number 4 corresponds to the, uh, the abelian group z to the power, uh, z sub 2 to the power 3, so z8, direct sum z to the power 2 to the power 1, which is z2. So each one of these different partitions gives me a different abelian group of uh, sum of abelian groups of prime power order that we could be looking at. And therefore, I've got five options for how to partition my four powers of 2. I have two options for how to partition my two powers of 3. I only have one option for my power of 7. I have to just take it. And therefore, I have a total of 5 times 2 times 1, or 10, different options, different possibilities, and my group G has to be isomorphic to one of them. And we know it's going to be 10 and not more as long as the sequencing of these groups doesn't matter. As long as it doesn't matter, for example, if I take Z8 and Z2 and trade places, or if I take the Z3 and the Z7 here and I trade places, we know that direct products are indeed commutative up to isomorphism, so that sequencing doesn't matter at all. And therefore, 
we find that every finite abelian group, g, is a direct product of cyclic groups whose order is the power of primes, and that that direct product is determined up to isomorphism only by the group g. We can reorder the product if we want to, but the group g itself determines completely the isomorphism class that we get. So this is a really powerful theorem because it helps us know that all we need to account for all the possibilities for finite abelian groups are to use primes don't talk to break it apart into separate prime powers of which it's a direct product, and then each of those prime power abelian groups can be further broken down using the prime powers partition into direct products of perhaps smaller and still prime power order groups. So for the example of groups of order 1008, we now know that there's these 10 different possibilities because we have uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 different ways of partitioning my four powers of 2 to make up my subgroup of order 16. And then I have two different ways, Z9 and Z3 plus Z3, to partition my two powers of 3. And I only have one way of dealing with my, uh, my power of 7. I only have a single power of 7, so I've just got to take it, and that gives me a Z7 factor. And so here's all 10 isomorphism class possibilities for my groups of order 1008. So this is really valuable because it, it really narrows the universe of possibilities. If I know I have an abelian group that's uh, order 1008, I know it's got to be isomorphic to one of these 10 things, and there's no other possibility out there in the universe. What the theorem doesn't do is the theorem isn't going to tell us exactly which one of these 10 my group is going to be. For that, I would need some more information. If I know something more about my group, then I should be able to narrow down the possibilities a little bit more. So let's look at an example of how that might work. If I know I've got an abelian group of order 1008, I know it's got to be one of these 10 things up to isomorphism. But what kind of information might I need in order to narrow down the universe a little bit more, to get more specific? Well, one of the most important things that we can know about a group, and probably the most useful way to differentiate a finite group from another finite group, is to say something about the orders of its elements. For example, suppose that I know, based on received knowledge from the universe, that G does not have an element of order 24 in it. Is there a way we can then revise our options? Which of these 10 things might it be, and which will it definitely not be, based on this new information that G doesn't have elements of order 24? Well, where are we going to get elements of order 24 from in a direct product of cyclic groups? Well, we have this fantastic least common multiples theorem that tells me the only way to get an element of order 24 is to have uh, orders in these cyclic factors that have divisors whose least common multiple turns out to be 24. But the only way to get 24 is the least common multiple of powers of 2, powers of 3, and powers of 7 is for it to be the least common multiple of 8 and 3. There's no other powers of 2, 3, and 7 that can combine together whose least common multiple is going to give me 24. And so if I have elements of order 8 and if I have elements of order 3, then I will have an element of order 24 in my group. And if I don't, then I won't. So what that means is that my order 8 elements, well, we know they're only going to come from two possible places in this list. They're going to come from the cyclic groups of order 16, so those have elements of order 8 in them because 8 is a divisor of 16 and this is a cyclic factor. But then also the generators of my Z8 factors are also going to be elements of order 8 inside of these groups. Meanwhile, my elements of order 3 are going to come either from my cyclic groups of order 9 because 3 is a divisor of 9 or from the generators of one of my Z mod 3 factors. So what we learn from all of this is that all of my options here that have a Z16 or a Z8 as one of the factors are definitely going to have an element of order 24 because they'll have an element of order 8 and all these options have an element of order 3 and the LCM of 8 and 3 is going to give me 24. And so if I know that G is a group that doesn't have an element of order 24, then it's got to be one of these options that doesn't have a Z16 or a Z8 but which is only built out of the prime power orders Z4 and Z2 on the prime 2 side. So what it lets me do is rule out these four possibilities, because these four possibilities all have elements of order 24. For example, this one is going to have an element of order 24 coming from the generator of this Z8 and the element of order 3, maybe the, 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 the number 3 inside of this Z mod 9 factor. Those two together are going to combine together order 8, order 3, to give me an element of order 24. 
but all these other possibilities, there is no way to get 24 as the order of one of the elements. Therefore, knowing that G does not have an element of order 24 narrows my universe of possibilities from 10 options down to 6 options. Of course, if we wanted to narrow that further, we would need some more information still. But this gives you a flavor for how we can start from the fundamental theorem which prescribes the whole universe, and then shrink that universe by using additional information that we might know about our group.